550. It's a relatively big number. That's an approximate number of how many books you get on machine learning on Safari books online when you search. And that's the reduced number, because I took out all the ones that were not really relevant to machine learning, but just had machine or learning into it. So I had three months to learn machine learning from scratch to give this 30-minute talk. That's not a lot of time. It sounds like a lot of time, but it isn't. Machine learning is a huge topic. But what I would like you to take from this talk is my journey into learning machine learning, some useful concepts, and also some useful resources where you could go and start your own machine learning journey. And that's basically how my presentation will be structured. First, I'm going to give a bit of an overview on machine learning. Then I'm going to have a more hands-on approach. I'm going to take a problem and try to solve it and show you what are the steps that you're probably going to do. And at the end, I'm going to talk about the different resources that you could use to learn machine learning, or the things that I found the most interesting out of the many things that I found. There are no books there, because I didn't have so much time to read entire books. <laughs> So, sorry for that. But, why learn machine learning? Personally, I have a specific reason why I started learning machine learning, and I'm going to reveal that at the end of my talk. So stay tuned. But generally, I feel machine learning is great to learn. It's another tool that you can put in your toolbox of things that you know. One great tool is the internet. Everybody uses it. But not everybody that uses the internet really knows the nuts and bolts under the internet and how it works, or where the routers are, and how many, and so on. Same with machine learning. You can do machine learning without knowing everything. There are already a lot of things implemented for that. That being said, starting to learn machine learning was a bit like jumping into the ocean. This is a cloud map of a lot of algorithms that I've seen, and I don't know all of them. So I had to be very selective on what to learn. But where does machine learning fit? Machine learning is a part of artificial intelligence. If you take artificial intelligence and think of it as a person, machine learning is probably the brain. Part of artificial intelligence is also the genetic algorithms. There's a talk from Maya, unfortunately, at the same time, talking about genetic algorithms but you're going to see that online on YouTube later, hopefully. <laughs> but what we're going to talk about is machine learning, and I'm going to take the hands-on example towards supervised learning. And about deep learning, I'm going to cover a bit of resources that might be useful. So I mentioned supervised learning, and unsupervised learning is another thing. What are they? Supervised learning is when you do machine learning on data that you already know stuff about. How many people have heard about supervised learning? That's a lot of people. So maybe I don't have to explain it so much in depth. Basically, imagine it as you want to buy a house, and you want to know how much your house, that, that house would cost. So you have the number of rooms for the house, the size of it, the neighborhood, and you also have historical data of other houses that have been sold and bought and the prices that were given for those. So what you do is you take that data set, you feed it into a machine learning algorithm to get a model, and then in, the, in that model, you put in the, the specifics of the house you're trying to figure out. So you put those in, and then you get the price out. 
unsupervised learning is more used for when you don't know how the data looks like or what exactly you're going to find. Like in monitoring, to find anomalies or outliers or to cluster things together. For example, what are movies that are similar? So then you just have a bunch of data that you still have to carefully construct and feed that to the machine learning model, and that will give you something. There's also semi-supervised learning. Supervised learning is static, so you just train a model and then it never changes. Semi-supervised, the model changes with the new data. It's dynamic. For example, you don't want to try to figure out the price of a house with data that was from 20 years ago. You want the data to evolve just like the house pricing, right? So let's talk about examples. What are applications for machine learning? I've already mentioned one. There's several. This part is for supervised learning. This part is for unsupervised learning. And I'm going to cover them now. So predictions. Predicting something is a very common use case. And usually people use supervised machine learning for it because it's pretty easy to do. Diagnosis. In medicine, you can take a bunch of data about cells. And for example, for cancer, you can check if they're ca cancer cells or not. Image recognition. Is this a cat in my image? Is this a dog? This is categorizing. You put things in buckets and say, OK, these, all, all these images belong into the cat bucket, and all these other images belong into the dog bucket. Unsupervised is outliers, as I mentioned, monitoring. and for clustering is putting things together. For example, you feed in this image, and then it puts all the graphics together. But it doesn't really tell you it's a graphic. <laughs> it just says, these things belong together. I, just, I don't know why, but they're similar. But what can't machine learning do? Machine learning can't really decide what kind of problem you're trying to solve. You have to have a good idea of what you're trying to do. So you have to decide beforehand, what am I trying to do? Then machine learning also needs data, and the right kind of data. The main differentiator between companies that use machine learning is how they handle the data, how much data they have, and how carefully they choose and curate it because the algorithms have been there for a long time, and the, they are all using the same kind of libraries. There's also bias. Bias is a big problem with data as well. It translates and even amplifies in machine learning. Take, for example, seat belts. Seat belts have been invented by a bunch of guys, and they tested it the best they could with a mannequin that looked similar to them. And then when the, it got into production, it killed a lot of women and children because they didn't have the body size that they were created for. And that's very dangerous. Another bad example is soap dispensers. There are soap dispensers that use re image recognition to dispense soap. And then, because they were trained with certain skin types, some don't work. And that's, again, horrible. So make sure that you, if you do machine learning, think about the entire population. Think about your data. Is it biased? Is it complete? Is it good? And I'm going to have a resource on a course about fairness and ethical data. So basically, it means it's garbage in, garbage out. What you put in, that's what you get. So how do you get about solving a problem? This is the hands-on part. How many of you have tried to run any kind of tutorial, any kind of Python program to solve machine learning stuff? Great. So some of you. 
I chose to use Python. I started actually with Clojure, but it was a bit hard and, and clumsy. I hope it will get better soon. So I use Python, and I'm going to, whatever I've done on the slides is generated by Python. I'm not going to show code, though. So how you start? You have a problem, as I said. Then you take the data for it, and you put it through an algorithm to generate a model. And then you test the model. And then you go through the circle again. And we're going to go through all of these steps now. Starting with the problem. I chose the hello world of machine learning. If anybody here would have opened a book or an article or anything around machine learning, they might have stumbled on this data set. It's about f flowers. So there's iris flowers, and you have three categories for them. And according to your data set, you have to categorize and say, this line belongs to this flower, and so on. So it's just putting things into three buckets. So how do we go about solving this problem? We have the data. Fortunately, the data that we have is already very useful. It doesn't need cleaning. But when you start with a data set that you don't know, that is not a test data set or, the, or a toy data set, you really have to take that in consideration. But I'm not going to cover this right now. So how does our data look like? You have a table. Actually, it's a CSV. And you have the sepal length and the width here uh, in the first rows. And then you already have the classification for it. So that's our data. And you can already look at data using three methods. I chose these ones. And that is having a box and whisker chat, histograms, and a scatter matrix plot. Have any of you used any of these ones? Show of hands. Even less. Good. Great that I decided to include explanations for them. This one confused me at the beginning, because I wasn't really sure what the box was and what the lines were. And I actually had to look in, in Wikipedia. I'm going to try to explain it. So you have a bunch of numbers, and they don't really tell you anything when they're all bunched up. And if you expand them and you plot them as they are, you see that 100 is pretty high up, 1 is down, and then everything kind of bunches in the middle. And then you take the median, and that's the green line that you saw. And that's the number at index number 3. We have 10 values, and here is index number 3. Uh, 10, 7, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking of 100. Anyway, so this is at index number three. And then you have two things left, top and bottom, and you take the middle of those, and that is where the box is drawn. And that's it. And you can see if it bunches up together, that means that most of the values, like around 50% of your values, bunch up in the middle, or if they're kind of spread out. So you can get some insight in your data. And this is how it looks. So you can see that the sepal bunches up in the middle, and the petal length, it kind of spreads out. And the green line is in the middle. Histograms are great for seeing data distribution, if you get a bell curve, and so on. It's, I cannot really say a lot more about it, but it's generally good to look at it. Scatter plot matrices, matrices is when you plot features, like the sepal length according to the width, against each other. So the sepal length is on the y-axis for graph 1, and on the x-axis you get sepal width. And then you, you can see things clustering around. You can, you can kind of draw a circle around things. But you can also see in graph number 2 that you have a correlation that both of them grow at the same time, and you have this di uh, diagonal line. And this is how it looks in general. 
For this particular graph, we put histograms on the diagonal because you don't really want to plot things against themselves. You just get a line, and that is not really very helpful. One thing that you should do with data is you should split it. I talked about testing your al algorithm. This is how you test your algorithm. You test it by using data that you already know. And then you pass that data in, you do a prediction, and you compare it to the truth. The way I, did, I had it, and that's because it's good for that data set, was 80-20. But what you want to do, really, is to use as much data as you can to train your algorithm, and then still leave enough data to have statistical significance for testing your algorithm. Now, about the algorithms. How does that work? Well, you take a whole bunch of them. Here, there are six and I'm not going to go into detail on each of them. But you take a bunch of them, and you see how accurate they are. This is one way of doing it. It's not the only way, but one way of doing it. And then you pick one that looks the best. KNN, which is K nearest neighbors, has the best mean accuracy and the standard error. So we just pick that. What is k nearest neighbors? It basically means that you take the unknown data that you're feeding your model, and it looks for all the data that you have in your model that is around it. And for example, if you take three neighbors, it will t pick the one square and two triangles in the small circle. And your, your model will say, well, this is most likely a triangle. So instead of the question mark, it will say, yeah, this is a triangle. But if you increase the number of neighbors, let's say if you have five neighbors instead, then you most likely will get squares as the answer, because now you have three squares and two triangles. Of course, this is simplified. <laughs> Put it on n dimensions. That's very hard to plot. <laughs> but the machines can do it anyway. Now we get to the interesting part. How do you test it? Just like the data visualization, I picked three ways of looking at the data and seeing how your algorithms did. And the first one is the accuracy score. It basically means out of the things that you've predicted, how many of them were really the right thing? And that's about it. Then you have the confusion matrix. If you take the diagonal of it, you can see that those are the ones that it predicted correctly. It plots the predicted value according to the actual one. And the orange numbers are really the numbers that it got wrong, things that it misclassified. So it misclassified to Virginica into Vesicolor. I cannot really spell that. Yeah. But yeah, that's what it is. The precision and recall is hard to explain for me, and I hope I'm going to do a good job to present it to you. For the sake of the explanation, I said we have this square of data, and this half is people that are sick, and the other half is people that are not sick. And this is the prediction. It's a pretty bad prediction, because it just takes half of the non-sick people. It's weird. But let's say these are predicted sick, and all the people outside are not sick. And this will help me explain precision and recall. So basically, precision is how many of the people that you predicted were really sick. So it gives you a percentage of that. And recall is interested in how many of the people that were sick you really detected. And that's kind of what I tried to display there. 
And these are the numbers for our data set. So that's pretty good. But again, this is a test data set, and it's fairly straightforward. Most likely, you would have to try around a couple of times for your actual data. So this is it. This is how you solve a machine learning problem. You start with the problem. You define the problem really well. You try to fit it in one of the existing machine learning categories, and you try to follow up something else. You look at the data, and you do feature engineering. I've heard that word from our kind analytics department. And you try to make sure that it's as clean as possible and as usable as possible. You choose some algorithms, and then you test it. And that's how it works. So what are the tools? If you're using Python, just install Anaconda. It, it is a package that has all the libraries that you need. And trust me, I've tried. When you don't use Anaconda and you try to install matplotlib on top of your stuff, it just gets messy. So yeah. And it's also messy if you're not using virtual environments and you have Python already, and then you install Anaconda on top. So yeah, good luck. It's still, it's still the best way I found, and it's kind of cleaner than Clojure, which is odd. And of course, Python is not the only language that ha covers this. You can do that in Scala and Java and a lot of other languages. Data. There's two data, so data sources that I would like to mention. There's Kaggle, which is a new website full of a lot of data sets. And there's the University of California, Irvine, that has a machine learning repository. And both are pretty good. The second one is referenced a lot. What about the theory? I have to mention these three courses. The first one from Coursera, from Andrea and G, is the first one I started with. It's great. It's really easy to get into. It does use Octave, which is the open source version of MATLAB, but it's really good. Then there's the deep learning course on Udacity that is in collaboration with Google. And this is the course that I mentioned on how to Try to make your data not be mean. <laughs> then there's these four websites. Scikit-learn is for Python, and for Scikit in, in particular. Fast.ai is for deep learning. It has a practical course on deep learning. Machine Learning Mastery is a blog with a lot of very useful articles. And Data Science Masters is a good website, which has a lot of resources. Unfortunately, when you're done with the website, you're probably a lot older. <laughs> uh. And of course, for news, try KD Nuggets. It's really good, and I got recommendations for it. So that was it. This is my way of approaching learn, uh, solving a machine learning problem. But why did I decide to give this talk? Why did I want to learn machine learning? Well, I was sitting on the couches with Johan here, who's in the first row, wave. <laughs> um, and we were talking about how to improve the things that we're doing. Basically, we're moving traffic from one, ch uh, one check out backend to another, and we would like to figure out if we broke anything. And he mentioned machine learning, and I said, yeah, that sounds really cool. I would really like to try that out. And at the same time, the call for, for, for talks for the conference happened. So I said, great, awesome. So I want to tie into the keynote that we had this morning and repeat this. I did say yes, and I connected the dots between what we wanted to do in our team and what I wanted to learn, and I did have my own opportunities. I didn't make my own opportunities. It was a very inspiring keynote. And I would really like to thank 
the people from the analytics department, specifically Samara, Werner, and Deepa. They helped me with all of this. I got a lot of useful information and I jumped a lot of, well, I knew where to look for things. So when I'm trying to learn something that I don't know, I don't know what I'm trying to learn. So I ask people that do. So go on the data science Slack channel and ask them all the, all the questions that you want. <laughs>